Okay. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the 2020 Ian Purcell Oration. It's my pleasure to be able to be here with you together with our Policy and Project Officer and MC, Kelly Vincent, for tonight's event and especially to join you at such short notice given the latest COVID-19 restrictions that came into effect last night. 2020 has been a huge year for SARA. Uh, as Kelly just mentioned for our audience, we've just brought on board our first paid employee thanks to a contract with the Department of Human Services. But of course, more importantly, it's been a gigantic year for our community and uh, the world as a whole. So we're glad that we can continue to hold this event to bring our community together and talk about why ongoing advocacy is important and to obviously always honour the memory of Ian Purcell as our founder at SARA, but as so much more within our community as well. In terms of SARA over the last 12 months, we found ourselves doing a whole range of advocacy topics. We've got a few law reforms going on in government here in South Australia at the moment. We're continuing to advocate around trans healthcare and uh, lots of other bits and pieces. We'll also talk a little bit later tonight about some of the things that we'll be doing over the coming weeks and months, including some exciting opportunities for the community to become more involved with our advocacy. But uh, on behalf of Sara, thank you very much for being here with us all tonight. And once again, a thank you to our sponsors, to ECH, to SACOS, to Coder SA, and to Shine SA for their support this year and for several of our sponsors for continued support over the last few years. I'm gonna hand back to Kelly so we can keep things moving, but I hope you all enjoy this evening's event in memory of Ian Purcell. Thank you so much, Matt. As previously stated, we do rely very heavily on the financial support as a volunteer organization of a lot of organizations and our principal sponsor for tonight's event ECH. So as one last uh, formality, I'm very happy to hand over to David Panter to say some words on behalf of ECH as our principal sponsor for tonight's oration. Thanks, David. Hi there, everybody, and um, welcome to this evening's Ian Purcell Oration. Um, I'm very proud on behalf of ECH to sponsor this event and be here with you this evening. Um, we at ECH, as a not-for-profit, um, understand the pressures on organisations who rely upon um, a mixture of funding and often on volunteer support. And we're huge supporters of SARA, for the work that SARA does generally and specifically working with organisations like ECH and COTA SA um, with regard to the particular issues facing older members of the LGBTI community. And so sponsoring and being principal sponsor of the Ian Perceleration is particularly important for us at ECH because we recognise Ian as an elder within the LGBTI community who across the course of his life contributed enormously um, to the community and to the wider community and the greater good. And so it's very much a celebration of an older person um, as well as somebody who has contributed throughout their life course. Um, so very proud to be involved with this event uh, and I hope we will continue to be involved in future years um, and hopefully next year we'll be back in person where we can all enjoy um, a glass in honour of Ian as well as um, hear the orator. So thank you very much for asking me to say a few words this evening uh, and hand back to you um, Kelly. Thank you so much, David. And again, our sincere thanks to ECH for all of their support of SARA. Um, now to the business of the evening. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome the orator of the 2020 Ian Purcell Oration, Dr. Nikki Sullivan. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Nikki Sullivan is manager of the trust 
Sorry, I'll start that again. Manager of the History Trust of South Australia's Centre of Democracy and adjunct professor in the School of Humanities at the University of Adelaide. So she's not busy at all, and it was quite easy for her to give up some time to be here tonight. Licky's activism began 35 years ago when, as a mature age student at Flinders, she discovered feminism. Since then, she's been lucky enough to be employed in positions that have allowed her to tackle at least some of the forms of injustice that make her blood boil. And I certainly know what a pleasure it is to get those kind of jobs, Nikki. Prior to taking up her current position, Nikki was a curator at the Migration Museum, where she made it her mission to ensure that queer lives, histories, issues and objects are collected, cared for, researched and shared. Nikki has had a long term career in academia, teaching cultural studies, often with a focus on gender and sexuality at Macquarie University and the University of South Australia. She has published books, book chapters and journal articles on queer theory and practice, LGBTIQ plus history, museum studies and a range of forms of body modification. Her latest book, which is co-authored with Craig Middleton, is called Queering the Museum. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Nikki Sullivan. Hello. Okay. Am I working or am I not? We can see you. Oh, you can? Okay, I can't see me for some reason. Okay, I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. So just give me a second. Okay. Sorry, I'm not that great with all of this kind of palaver, as my mother would say. Oops, no, that's not what I meant to do. Let me go back to the beginning. Sorry. Well, first of all, let me say how glad I am to be here and um, how grateful I am to Sarah for inviting me. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the country that we meet on is Ghana country and it's country that was never ceded. I'd like to pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. And I'd also like to thank Dom for reminding us that as an welcome guests, we have a responsibility um, and an obligation to do our best to fulfill that responsibility uh, in supporting our First Nations brothers and sisters. I also want to begin by saying how humbled I am to be here. I'm not sure if I'm walking in the footsteps or standing in the shoes of, but whatever it is, I'm very humbled to be doing it of the late great Ian Purcell, a man we all loved and an activist whose contributions to our community and to the rights and privileges we now take for granted are immeasurable. I can only hope that the thoughts that I share with you tonight do justice to his legacy. My first response to the invitation to speak tonight was to begin compiling a list of significant moments and events in the history of LGBTQ protests in Australia. But very quickly, I began to feel uncomfortable about what I was doing. A number of things kept sort of niggling away at me. The first was that much of this work has already been done far better than I could ever do it by historians such as Graham Willett, Rebecca Jennings, Gary Weatherspoon, Dennis Altman, Barbara Baird, Clive Moore, Shirlene Robinson, and I could go on and on and on with those lists, but I won't. The second thing uh, that bothered me was that in presuming to tell the story of LGBTQ protests in Australia, I necessarily risked reproducing a narrative that excludes as much as it includes and that homogenizes difference. 
third, a history of protest, I realised, would inevitably focus on those spectacular events that most of us are familiar with, at the cost of ignoring the everyday acts of protest that are not recorded, remembered, or acknowledged as such. As many before me have argued, histories of, whether they be, you know, histories of sheep farming or histories of trade unionism, um, tend to reproduce inequalities by hierarchizing events, individuals, actions, and centering, even if inadvertently, white, middle-class, able-bodied, cisgendered men, or sometimes women. Just as mainstream histories are heteronormative, at least in my opinion, LGBTQ histories also have a tendency to be homonormative, or at least if we're not kind of mindful of that. But before I embark then on my sort of alternative exploration of protest, it might be useful for me to just say a little bit more about these terms, heteronormativity and homonormativity, since they are central to my thinking, to who I am and to the things that I do. Um, this quote from Lauren Berlant and Michael Warner is one that I've used many, many, many times over the years. And it, it, to me, it's, it offers an incredible definition of heteronormativity. They write, by heteronormativity, we mean the institutions, structures of understanding and practical orientations that make heterosexuality seem not only coherent, that is, organised as a sexuality, but also privileged. Its coherence is always provisional and its privilege can take several sometimes contradictory forms. So for example, unmarked as the basic idiom of the personal and the social or marked as a natural state. And evidence of that is the fact that, you know, we never ask heterosexual people, what made you heterosexual? Or projected as an ideal or a moral accomplishment as that which we will be if all goes well, or that which we will become if we are cured or put back on the straight and narrow by medicine, religion, or whatever other organization it is that claims to know what is natural, right, and best. Heteronormativity, write Berlant and Warner, consists less of norms that could be summarized as a body of doctrine than a sense of rightness, and I really want to hang on to that idea of a sense of rightness, produced in contradictory manifestations, often unconscious, imminent in practice or institutions. Contexts, they write, that have little visible relation to sex practice, such as life narrative or generational identity, can be heteronormative in this sense. So I do family trees. <laughs> and, and if anybody's ever done one on somewhere like Ancestry, you'll see how, you know, completely heteronormative they are. While in other contexts, write Berlant and Warner, sex between men and women might not be heteronormative. Heteronormativity is therefore a concept distinct from heterosexuality. So what then is heteronormativity? Oops, that's not what I meant to do, sorry. Homonormativity, sorry. I'm terrible with these slides. Right, okay. Get your act together, Nikki. Um, the term homonormativity was developed, I, I think, by Lisa Duggan uh, in around 2003, or at least this is her uh, definition of that. Homonormativity, she says, is a politics that does not contest dominant heteronormative assumptions and institutions, but upholds and sustains them, while promising the possibility of a demobilized gay culture anchored in domesticity and consumption. Homonormativity is a privileging set of hierarchies, social norms and expectations that cause the oppressed to oppress one another. And this is something I really want to keep in mind as we reflect on protest, on our understandings of it, and on the effects that these different understandings might have. 
So what is homonormativity then in, in, in practice? You know, we can sort of come up with these sort of abstract ideas, but let's think about what are some examples of homonormativity. These are examples that are not my own, but I think that they're useful ones. Homonormativity is dismissing black men in the club because while you respect black men, you're not attracted to them. Homonormativity is thinking differently about someone you love on Twitter when you see they use a wheelchair. Homonormativity is gay white men dominating queer TV representation and white cis men playing trans women. Homonormativity is the nation organizing for gay marriage, but not for trans lives. I should add here that what may be appear to be homonormative and therefore problematic to one person may well not be to another. Um, and, and again, I think if we think of same sex marriage here, that's a really poignant example. While almost everyone I know supported the right of LGBTQ people to get married, many, including myself, remain uncomfortable with the institution of marriage. But acknowledging and respecting these differences of opinion is for me integral to a strong, positive community. And consequently, I'm not interested in trying to determine for others or in any absolute sense, what is and what is not homonormative or what does and does not constitute protest. What I am interested in exploring is how we might think of protest as something we are all in varying ways involved in. Acknowledging this seems to me to be imperative. I was reminded of this just recently when a young woman I was working with told me rather nervously that she didn't think she had earned the right to participate in an exhibition I was organizing on contemporary activism since, and these are her words, she'd never really done anything important. We'd spent the previous hour discussing current injustices and how we might tackle them. And yet she didn't recognize her feelings, her thoughts, or the sharing of these with others as constituting protest. And I find this really troubling. And I guess in a sense, this paper is an attempt to sort of respond to that. So protest. Having been an academic for most of my adult life, the, the habit of turning to the dictionary to find out about a term and its history is one I find hard to break. So when I was invited to speak at this event, I went straight to my shorter Oxford. The word protest, it told me, comes from the Latin protestare, from pro meaning before or in front of, and testare, to witness or testify. To protest then is to make a public declaration. For example, to protest one's innocence. In the mid 18th century, the term protest came to be associated with a statement of disapproval, but it wasn't until the mid 20th century that it was used to refer to the expressing of dissent from or rejection of prevailing mores. Interestingly, when we hear the term protest, we tend to think of mass rallies and marches. And yet the first recorded usage of the term protest march was allegedly in a 1959 report on the civil rights movement in the United States. Perhaps as Clive Hamilton suggests in his wonderfully illustrated book, What Do We Want? The Story of Protest in Australia, when we think of protest, we tend to think of the 60s and 70s, since these decades saw the rise internationally of social movements that radically challenged, challenged sorry, existing norms and ushered in many of the rights we take for granted today. Many of us here will remember, or at least have heard of, the women's liberation movement and the marches that women's liberationists were involved in um, and organized, particularly in the 1960s and 70s, but of course, long after that too. The establishment in 1972 of the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in Canberra, Australia's longest running protest. 
the anti-conscription protests that took place across Australia between 1860, uh, 1965 sorry, and 1972. The massive moratorium protests against Australia's involvement in the Vietnam War that occurred in the same period. And of course, the, the thing that probably we're all most familiar with, and that is the first Mardi Gras, which took place in Sydney in 1978. There is no doubt that these events were significant, that they contributed in important ways to social change. But at the same time that these spectacular forms of protest were taking place, People were involved in everyday acts of protest that were not seen as momentous, were not recorded for posterity, and as a result, have not been remembered. The punks who wrote songs in their bedrooms and played them if they were lucky to a handful of hardcore fans in dingy pubs across the country. The educators who encouraged students to think critically the adults who took the time to explain to a child the wrongness of not letting another child play because of the color of their skin, the shape of their body, the language they spoke or the food they ate. The child who befriended the newbie that everyone else ignored. Or Mathman Marika, the Yolongu man, who in 1969 led a dance of anger in protest against the desecration of sacred sites by mining companies, an event that many of us probably know nothing at all about. All of these people contributed in varying ways and to varying degrees to social change. And they all did so, whether consciously and intentionally or not, by expressing dissent from and rejection of prevailing norms. Jermaine Greer once said, protest is necessary, as necessary as the word no. While I find many of Greer's more recent claims hugely problematic, I'm not really one for throwing out the baby with the bathwater. And this claim is one I find particularly poignant. It reminds me that protest is and must necessarily be without end. We need only to look around us to see that none of the struggles depicted in the images from the 60s and 70s that I've shared are over. That rights granted at one point in history can easily be withdrawn at another. And that we are or were never all positioned equally with regard to those rights to begin with. So how might we begin then to think of protest as something that is necessary and ongoing, that can be spectacular and unremarkable, that we all participating in varying ways? And how, and more importantly, might we do this without reproducing hierarchies of action and thus of the people who perform such action, without excluding others and or reproducing existing inequalities. I guess that's the, the, the thing that I really wanna tackle in this lecture. So for the remainder of my talk, I want to explore one possible response to these questions. The thoughts I offer are, I guess, shaped by many things. Um, by my background in feminism, but also by my experience in working in the higher education sector during a time of massive and ongoing change. I have since left academia, but many of my friends remain there, each becoming increasingly diminished, increasingly unwell. While much has been written about the sad and deeply unethical situation in which the higher education sector finds itself, little of that work addresses the very real physical and emotional experience of being required on a daily basis to swallow ideas and ideals that make you sick, to suffer in silence for the good of neoliberalism. The same I wanna suggest could be said of heteronormativity and its ill effects. 
How often do critiques of, of the growing gap between rich and poor, of racism, of ableism, of normative notions of the family, gender, intimacy, explore the visceral politics of power and privilege? I want to put the ache back into protest. Some years ago, I read a paper by Andrew Sparks in which the author tells of Jim, the perhaps fictional director of a university research center, who is exhausted, angry, fearful, anxious, despairing, diminished, eroded, dehumanized by the world in which he lives. Jim, who like so many of us, begins each day by swallowing selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors to retard the chemical messengers that trigger accelerated heartbeat, increased blood flow, excessive sweat, sweating, shortness of breath, and other physical and emotional symptoms that would otherwise hold us back from daily entering a world that for all sorts of reasons and in all sorts of ways, others us. For me, Sparks' story puts the ache back in scholarly critiques of the neoliberal university. And I wanna suggest it has the capacity to do the same thing when it comes to thinking about, when it comes to rethinking, we might say, protest. As others before me have noted, the hidden injuries inflicted by heteronormativity, and I, I'm gonna show you an example of this in a minute, um, may seem at one level sort of, you know, ordinary. So on a daily basis, we're faced with these kinds of images of the modern family. And this is from the Australian government's Institute of Family Studies. This is the modern family. So the hidden injuries inflicted by images like this of the family as heterosexual, white, able-bodied, cisgendered, and so on, are, as I said, ordinary and everyday, but they are no less damaging for that. We know this. We know these hidden injuries. We feel them. We share them with one another. And yet, we rarely hear them addressed in accounts of protest, in keynote speeches, in LGBTQ histories except, of course, in the abstract. For me, this curious logic and our complicity in it, our tendency to talk about marches, but not about feelings, and perhaps more damaging still, to turn a blind eye to discomfort, screams out for consideration. How is it, I wonder, that I can bear not to rage every time the customer service person on the other end of the phone assumes my partner to be a he? Why is it that we don't tear at our hair and spit curses every time we visit a museum and find that our most significant relationships are deemed too problematic or too inconsequential to be given space? And that if First Nations people are represented, they are relegated to the natural history of section, along with animals and rocks and dinosaurs. And that those whose bodies are regarded as atypical may never ever see themselves in the hallowed halls of the world's biggest tourist destinations. Heteronormativity can't be reduced to a tidal wave of policies separated from the lived bodily experience of people. Heteronormativity shapes what we do and the kinds of people we become. Heteronormativity is stealth. In spite of ourselves, our politics, our principles, it creeps up on us and it inserts itself into our hearts, minds, guts, bloodstream wreaking havoc in the bodies, the lives of we who swallow it. And swallow it we do, despite the fact that it makes us ill. Once in a dark dingy bar, hot with the sweat of freaks and outliers, I witnessed the space cowboy swallow a fluorescent light tube 
with a microphone attached to the end. It lit up his insides and made audible the cost of his calling. The gag reflex is not an easy thing to listen to, nor is a heart quickened by fear. Years later, I saw him do it again on Australia's Got Talent or X Factor, I forget which one it was now. But what I do remember is Danny Minogue squirming in her pristine white leather judge's throne, struggling to bulwark her eyes, her ears with too few hands, afraid of the contamination the connection might bring. Needless to say, the space cowboy didn't win. I don't know how he felt about that, but his gut reactions got me thinking, as did Danny's. Swallowing swords is no easy matter. It takes practice and lots of it. As Tracy Wilson explains, a successful sword swallower has to learn to ignore the gag reflex. This is not an easy process. Reflexes are involuntary. They happen without deliberate effort or thought. Learning to ignore an involuntary process takes a tremendous amount of practice. In the case of sword swallowing, it generally involves deliberately activating the gag reflex over and over. The process can cause vomiting and, dis dis sorry, and considerable discomfort. And this is the, the point that I really want us to think about. It also dulls or removes a process intended to protect the person from harm. Sword swallowing, involves deliberately conditioning your body to do something its defense mechanisms prohibit. So it's not surprising that it's a dangerous activity. To put all that more succinctly as sideshow performer Albert Cadabra, or uh, also known as the great deceiver does, in order to swallow well, you have to convince yourself that it's a normal thing to do. Swallowing then is a disciplinary practice, a matter of training. It institutionalizes us, it normalizes, it desensitizes, it dulls the bodily responses to injustice that drive the work. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna start that sentence again. Swallowing then is a disciplinary practice, a matter of training. It institutionalizes, it normalizes, it desensitizes. It dulls the bodily responses to injustice that drive the work that many of us do. In the world of heteronormativity, swallowing what makes us sick on a daily basis is normal. Heteronormativity is stealth. I want to think of the gag reflex as a form of protest that all too often barely registers as such. And like the space cowboy, I want to amplify my bodily response to swallowing things that make me ill. I want to develop the art of engaged retching as a bodily refusal to internalize the ideas and ideals that reproduce structural inequalities and maintain positions of power and privilege at a cost that is devastating to those who cannot or will not inhabit them. My point is that rather than thinking that we haven't organized enough marches or spent enough hours on the steps of Parliament House to see ourselves as activists or reproducing hierarchies between those who have done those things and those who haven't, not recognizing all the time that structural inequalities that make those things possible for some people make them impossible for others. We might instead, I want to suggest, work to recognize, acknowledge, activate the power and potential of those moments of bodily refusal, no matter how small, no matter how insignificant they might seem. Theodore Adorno once said that the splinter in your eye is the best magnifying glass. 
I take this to mean that the things that hurt us can be appropriated and used to our own ends. So let me give you a wonderful example from a project that the Centre of Democracy is currently running called Stitch and Resist, which I already blew, didn't I? Because I'm terrible with these slides. Okay. So this piece consists of a poem that was written in 1639 by John Taylor, in which he declares that, and for countries quiet, I should like that women kind should use no other pike. It will increase their peace, enlarge their store to use their tongues less and their needles more. In other words, women should be seen and not heard. Um, and of course, Kristen Phillips, who created the piece, has then kind of spewed forth this, I think, incredibly kind of visceral response with the needle. She's kind of used the needle against itself. The gag reflex enables us, I want to suggest, and I want to suggest that this is what that, this piece by Kristen Phillips shows, is that to reject those ideas or ideals that make us sick and to do so in ways that may not ordinarily be associated with protest is not only possible, but is fruitful, is powerful. And amplifying the gag reflex and the discomfort that that causes is a form of activism that I wanna argue need not be hierarchical, exclusory or divisive. My gag reflex comes everywhere with me. Like hothead paisans, demon, it sits on my shoulder, behind my eyes, in my bald fists, at the back of my throat. When I was young, it mostly arced up in close proximity to green vegetables. Although not being middle class, hypocrisy didn't sit well with it either. At university, my gag reflex met feminism and everything changed. Since then, I've always felt disturbed, no, demeaned by on your knees, head held swallowing. The glory of deep throating was one I was trained for, but Andrea Dworkin intervened, arms akimbo, and despite our differences, I'm grateful to her for that. I am to steal a, a line from the magnificent Jeanette Winterson, 23 feet of feminist intestines, cocked, alert, ready to shoot from the mouth. My willful epiglottis is me. But in case it sounds as if I'm blowing my own trumpet here, let me make it clear that my gag reflex is not principled, at least not in terms that invite congratulation. I am not brave. While I'm constructed as willful by those who find my behavior distasteful, my gagging is not a willed reaction. Although I do have to admit feeling pleased with myself on the odd occasion that my retching has proved victorious in a minor skirmish against heteronormative smugness. But at the same time that I'm telling you this, I'm desperately worried that I'm oversharing, that I'm offending you, that you're finding all this talk about swallowing and gag reflexes unpalatable, that protest in the phenomenological sense I'm articulating it does not belong in an oration commemorating one of South Australia's greatest LGBTQ advocates, that you came here tonight to celebrate the gains that have been made through LGBTQ protest and not to be subjected to what some might see as a thoroughly improper diatribe. I had a nightmare about this last night. For God's sake, mouths the blush blushing archangel heteronorm perched demurely on my shoulder as my fingers strike the keyboard in a rhythm that matches my wounded heart. I stop, bite my fingernails, feel the knot of anxiety grow in my stomach. I want to apologize, to retract my words myself. But just as I'm about to press delete, that other presence I share with Hothead reminds me that shame is a wonderful tool in heteronormativity's arsenal. Stealth indeed. I will not swallow my words. Drawing on Ramsey Fawaz's brilliant account of the digestive 
politics and poetics of AIDS. I want to end by suggesting that protest in its many and varied forms might be usefully thought of as the art of engaged retching, as a visceral refusal to swallow ideas and ideals that make us sick. Engaging the gag reflex involves using a seemingly individualized felt bodily experience as the ground for articulating matters of collective concern, whereby feelings of nausea, anxiety, anger, disgust, shame can be named, transmitted between bodies and deployed to motivate public action. To know the gag reflex is to develop a promiscuous political outlook. After all, knowing in the biblical sense is about connection, not facts. Charge and discharge, not accumulation and containment. Let's have pride in this. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Wow. Nikki, thank you for that incredibly poignant and I think very timely reminder of, of what this protest does and more importantly can constitute. I think in the modern society with the use of technology in particular, protest is beginning to mean a lot of different things. And particularly for those of us who who come up against those structural inequalities that you mentioned, that is a very good thing. And so thank you for reminding us to be more consciously aware of the um, hierarchical nature that our discussions, even within our own communities, sometimes take, and for reminding us to demantle those. The more, or is it similarly, I always get those two mixed up, much to my year 11 English teacher chagrin. Um, of the gag reflex is a brilliant one because I think we've all encountered that at some point, whether it was those Brussels sprouts that you mentioned earlier, or indeed that, that passing comment that you're not quite sure is quite offensive enough to mention. We've all at some point in our lives swallowed something, uh, swallowed it back um, to cause ourselves those hidden injuries mentioned. And that is a brilliant term that I'm going to borrow from now on to remind myself that the pain or the discomfort of speaking up is worth avoiding that hidden injury, that death by a thousand cuts. Mm. Of course, it's not something that happens overnight for all of us. And we've got to uh, participate in what you so brilliantly called that engaged, watching, learning more and more to listen to and respond to those reflexes or what we might otherwise call our inner voice or comfort. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was absolutely brilliant. And I could have listened to that for hours more, but I'm so aware and grateful for your time that I will let you have a rest. But thank you so much for, for sharing so much of your knowledge, yourself, your heart, your spirit, your courage with us this evening. We, um, we did have um, some uh, gifts for this tonight, but I'm not exactly sure how <laughs> that's going to work um, given tonight's setup. Um, but I'm sure we'll find a way of delivering those to you somehow. But uh, I'd just like to take a moment. I know we can't applaud, but but I'll give you um, Auslan sign language applause in the interest of intersectional analogy. Thank you so much, um, Nikki. And of course, also to Dominic and David, our previous as well, you have set the bar high for intersectionality at future events, for speakers at future events, and we, we thank you for that. Um, let me just once seamlessly get my run sheet up. So it now falls upon me to rem to speak to you, everyone, about some comedies that Sarah is undertaking in terms of our work in the advocacy space. 
Um, there are a number of things happening. I'm only going to mention a few tonight in the interest of time, but I will also put my contact details in the, the group chat so that if anyone does want to get in touch to learn more, you can do that. Um, one of the, well, the key reason really that all um, was established in SARA was to help establish and conceptualise a community advisory group, um, both to assist and provide feedback on the work of SARA, but also more importantly, to provide a type of protest in terms of a voice to government reporting it back on how well it is or is not doing in implementing its own recommendations, particularly recommendations that came out of a roundtable that was held into LGBTIQ plus last year. Um, expressions of interest for participation or membership in that community advisory group are now open. Um, it only takes about five minutes to complete the expression of interest form. And you can on our Facebook page, but again, any trouble, please call me um, on the details that I will soon put in the chat. We're also undertaking a recruitment for the Zara board. We are particularly interested in um, ensuring that we have a more intersectional, linguistically diverse board, particularly when it comes to representation of First Nations people on that board. And Indeed, a community advisory group as well. We're also, and it would be wonderful if we could get um, these two two things done in, with one person, but I won't hold my breath. Looking for a new treasurer so that we can let our um, beloved but long-suffering Varu um, get back to things they would much rather be doing. Um, so any interest in that um, is welcome as well. Um, some of you might have seen as well, if you follow us on social media and other platforms, um, we are undertaking um, some work in the legislative space currently, um, seeking amendments to the gay panic bills before Parliament to ensure that not only is the gay panic defence, partial defence to murder of gay and bisexual men and queer men um, eradicated, but also that the punishments are actually elevated uh, for people who target someone because they form a part of a particular community or identity. So that could be LGBTIQ+, or it could be disability, race, cultural diversity, and so on. We have some exciting news in that space that I'm looking forward to sharing with you in the coming weeks. But uh, we also have a petition calling on the government to do this. There's already reached, I think you might, I'm right in saying, I haven't checked recently, almost 40,000 signatures. So if you'd like to add your voice to that issue in that way by signing our petition or in any other, please look us up and get in touch. As I said, there are more that I could mention, but in this interest of time, I am not going to. As a politician, you've got to be very careful with giving me a platform to speak because I will take it and milk it for all that it's worth. But I will just check with Matt um, that I haven't missed out anything too vital. Matt, if you want to let me know. And it's very hard to do that subtly over <laughs> this platform. But um, oh, thank you. Yes, Matt's linked the, uh, the link to the expression of interest form. Uh, in the chat, I'll just quickly type out my email address and phone number there while Matt lets me know of anything else you want. I think that's, uh, that's everything from our more formal end of things. I've just included the gay panic petition as well. But that being said, the chat is open for people who want to share any comments. So if there are any questions that people had for Nikki or uh, any comments that people would like to make in general, please feel free to share comments. Um, we might wrap up the formal part of the recording in a second. Um, so on behalf of everyone at SARA, I would like to thank you all for attending tonight and joining us for this year's in person oration. Thank you all so much for your participation. Um, in light of the developments around COVID, stay safe, stay healthy, socially distance, and let's get through this second wave together. Thank you all.